Merci le panel sur l'indemnisation du justiciable par l'action collective. La professeure Pichet l'avait mentionné dans son introduction. C'est une des préoccupations, et évidemment, au début de l'action collective, le but principal est d'indemniser les membres. Alors, voyons voir, suivant l'expérience de nos panélistes, les défis et réalités euh, qui vont avec l'indemnisation du justiciable. Je vous les présente tout de suite. Uh, the first one I will pronounce you, introduce you to is Professor Jasmika Kalajic, who joined the Windsor University Faculty of Law in 2009 after 12 years in private practice as a civil litigator. Our current research focuses on three areas, access to justice, class action, and legal ethics. She has published two books. In July 2014, she was appointed to her second three-year term as a member of the Law Foundation of Ontario's Class Actions Committee and in 2013 to the Law Commission of Ontario's Advisory Group for its Class Action Project. And Professor Kalajic is currently serving a two-year term as Associate Dean of the Faculty of Law. Welcome, Professor. We also have Mr. Laura Bruno, who specializes in class action dispute resolution, who has led complex claims adjudication and has worked in the field of claims relating to so many different fields, errors and omissions, institutional sex abuse, product liability, insurance coverage disputes, director and officer liability, mass tort, and private breaches. She served as the Ombudsman for the Federal Crown Corporation, the National Capital Commission for four years. And in 2016, Laura was proud to accept the outstanding contribution by an individual, individual lawyer award from Pro Bono Ontario. We also have after Mr. Professor Stefan Voigt, who is an associate professor at the University of Leuven Law School in Belgium and a host professor at the University of Assel. He teaches national, European, and international civil procedure. Um, he wrote his PhD thesis about complex litigation in Belgium, for which he received in 2014 the triannual prize of civil procedure, and he was a member of different governmental working groups on class action and mass disasters. And finally, last but not least, uh, Shana Chafai Parent, Maître Shana Chafai Parent, est candidate à la maîtrise de la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Montréal, œuvre à titre de coordonnatrice et chercheur au laboratoire sur les actions collectives. Elle, elle est membre du Barreau du Québec depuis 2013. C'est une ancienne collègue, elle a effectué son stage professionnel et pratiqué quelques années chez Gordon Banner Gervais avant de débuter sa maîtrise sous la direction de la professeure Catherine Piché sur le sujet du rôle de l'expert dans l'instance civile. Alors, uh, without any uh, further ado, I'll let Professor um, Jasminka Kalajika start uh, with her presentation. Merci beaucoup. Et merci à mon collègue et mon amie Catherine pour avoir m'invité à ce colloque important. Um, je suis très honorée uh, d'être ici parmi des penseurs impressionnants. Uh, et comme vous avez entendu, je suis très amant uh, dans un poste administratif. Um, alors, quand Daniel parle d'un état gélatineux, je comprends bien. Uh, so forgive me, if what I'm about to say makes no sense at all. Um, so, I'm, uh, I'm happy to speak uh, today about uh, CPRE distributions in class actions. Um, my talk is based on a paper that I published in the Canadian Bar Review a few years ago. Uh, to uh, make it worth your while, I have tried to update some of the empirical data. And I must say, in reviewing what I wrote a couple of years ago, um, my thinking has altered a little bit. So um, uh, you're, you're guinea pigs. Um, I'm going to experiment my new thinking, um, my somewhat new thinking about CPRE. Um, so uh, this title came to me, uh, dare I say it, um, 12 hours ago. Um, the, you know, because See, pray for so long in Canada, at least in the Ontario jurisprudence, has really focused on the compensatory benefits of a CPRE distribution or CIPRE distribution. Um, but as you will hear, I'll cut to the punchline, I think there has been a shift um, sort of under the radar, where now we're talking very much about CIPRE performing a behavior modification of deterrence function. And as we heard in our first panel today, in some ways, um, the deterrence and the compensatory functions are severed and, and, and at odds. Um, and I think that is illustrated aptly when we talk about Cypre, that in effect, if we favor the deterrence possibility or potential of Cypre, we are in effect de de deterring compensation. If you will. Um, so this is my brief roadmap. Um, I've given permission to cut me off um, if I exceed my time. 
Um, so I, I, very briefly, I know, I think most of you understand what Cypre means, but I, I want to introduce you to a taxonomy um, that I use, um, that I introduced a few years ago, the difference between residual and fixed Cypre distributions. I'm going to give you a little bit of statistical information. We're all thirsty for it. Um, I envy you in Quebec to have uh, Katrin in her lab doing such phenomenal empirical work. Um, we're way behind in Ontario. Um, so I'll give you what I've been able to find in the publicly available information. Um, and then I think we had, I'd like to have this, I, I hope, robust discussion about um, what it is we're trying to achieve when we say to a judge, please approve this separate distribution. Um, so very briefly, I think as most of you understand, um, Cypre is a trust principle that's been imported into class actions in order really to prevent, to prevent reversion. So in a situation where um, there is a settlement and not all of the funds can be distributed to the individual class members for whatever reason, um, they didn't make a claim, or there were fewer class members than expected, or we simply don't know how to identify the class members. Um, there is some money left over, and what do you do with the residue? Uh, the Law Commission of Ontario in 1982 talked about the options. One option is for the money to revert back to the defendants. Um, by and large, judges across Canada um, don't like that option uh, because, of course, it defeats the behavior modification <coughs> objective of civil litigation. It, they get to take back the money that is supposed to quantify the cost, the cost or the price of their wrongdoing. Um, another possibility is to simply prorate the residue among those class members who made a successful claim. And oddly, to my mind, oddly, um, for a long time, that also was resisted. Judges did not seem to favor the idea of prorating the residue among class members I think largely because of the view that that was somehow a windfall to those class members. So some class members get nothing for whatever reason, and other class members get more than their due. Um, so the third option is Cypre. So rather than the money go back to the defendants or to be prorated among class members, let's give it to some other organization, charity, um, another institution, law schools, for example. Um, and in this way, it would provide some indirect benefit to the class members. And so th this is where I think we need to start. The Law Reform Commission said in its report about Cypre that the court should be able to order that any residue be applied in a manner that, many re that may reasonably be expected to benefit some or all of the members of the class. So two things to note, which I've highlighted in blue. One, we're talking about a residue. So some amount of money that's left over after a claims process has come to an end. And the second point to note is the expectation that this residue will be applied in a way that will provide some benefit to the class members themselves. So not to the public at large, but to the class members. Um, the statute in Ontario doesn't mention the word Cypre, um, but courts have interpreted the interplay between two sections of the Act and I think this is an intellectual process that's been replicated across the country, although some statutes do now specifically mention Cypre. But largely it's seen as the interplay between the aggregate damages provision and the judgment distribution provisions of the Class Proceedings Act as authorizing Cypre distributions. So no explicit uh, mandate from the legislature to allow the distribution of funds, but this is how it's been interpreted by the judges. And the operative section is 24 sub 4 of Ontario's Act. Um, the court may order that all are part of an award that has not been distributed within a time set by the court be applied in any manner that may reasonably be expected to benefit class members, and so on. And again, I've highlighted in blue the two salient pieces of this puzzle, if you will. One is the idea that there has been a claims process that has come to an end at a time set by the court, and that you're going to distribute the money in a fashion that will provide a benefit to the class members, not to the public at large. So keep those two points in mind. Um, so this brings us then to this taxonomy. When I 
undertook a study of Cypre distributions in all class actions in Canada a few years ago. Um, I mean, the only way I could do it uh, was to search um, Canly or other databases, searching for the term Cypre or uh, Relica in the Quebec context. Um, in some cases, I followed up by going, my students and I followed up by going to individual plaintiff law firm websites to search all of their settled cases to the extent that they were published to see if there was mention of Cypre. So it's not a very scientific process, but it's the best I could do. And so what I discovered was that there really are two very different forms of Cypre. The residual form of Cypre is really in line with what we've just been talking about. The idea that there's leftover money, a residue, after money has already been distributed to eligible class members. Um, and so that is a very common provision that we see in settlement agreements. So the parties agree that if there is a residue, it won't revert to the defendant, instead it will be paid Cypre, and the judge is to approve the choice of beneficiary. Um, in terms of counting, quantifying how much money has been distributed as a result of these residual CPRE clauses, it's impossible to do so, or almost impossible. Um, one, because we don't know at the time that the settlement is approved how much, if any, money there will be left over. Um, often the parties simply leave for another day the question of who is going to receive such residue. So there's no way really of knowing how much money. But as uh, Catherine said in, in, in her introduction and looking at the data that she's collected, um, it's quite a common thing to see in settlement agreements that there's some amount of money um, left over. And I think you quantified it. Was it a, a million or something? Next. So there's residual. Fixed, on the other hand, is a very different animal. This is a, a, a situation where at the time that the settlement is negotiated and agreed upon, executed and approved, the parties to say there will be no claims process for all or part of the settlement fund. And we decide at Santi that the money instead is going to go to some non-party to the litigation. Girls and Boys Club of Canada, Autism Association, Breast Cancer Research, the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law, Ronald McDonald House, and the list goes on. So without even giving the opportunity to claim to class members to make a claim, the decision is made, it's too difficult, it's impracticable to locate these class members, the amounts of money in issue are too small to justify the expense of locating them and, and instituting a claims process. We decide that the money instead is going to go to charities or some other um, nonprofit organizations. And in this situation, it is possible to know both who is getting the money and how much, because it may be spelled out in the settlement agreement and is then the subject of some judicial discussion. Not always, but sometimes. So what, what did I find? And these are bare minimum numbers. So at the very least, in the 2001 to 2016 period, time period, um, there are reported decisions of 80 Cypre distributions. 42 of which are fixed, 38 residual, but as I say, that number for residual is, is you know, grossly inadequate. There are many more than 38. Um, but 42 fixed for a, a total amount distributed to parties that are, to entities that are not parties to the litigation of over $104 million. So ent entities, organizations that were not harmed by the defendant's alleged wrongdoing have received in that 15 year period well over, it's well over 100 million because there were several settlements where um, the judge couldn't determine exactly how much money was going to be distributed. So this is not an insignificant transfer of funds in the sense it's a form of distributive justice. And it performs a very different function depending on who gets the money. More about that in a minute. So what are, what are we doing? What policy are we trying to achieve in um, allowing class actions to settle and the settlement monies to be distributed in this manner? Well, again, go back to the Class Proceedings Act where we talk about a residue and we talk about benefiting the class members. In the jurisprudence, we see judges say things like, 
The whole point is to benefit, albeit indirectly, the class members. Cypre projects must be materially beneficial to the class. Um, so there is this sense that this is about providing a benefit, direct or indirect, on the very class members in whose name the litigation was brought. That's one line of thinking that I think was the predominant line of thinking for at least the first 10 years of this device being used in, in Ontario. In the US, um, courts, I, and I will stand to be corrected by our friend, Professor Sakharov, but courts, I think, insist on a nexus between the interests of the class members and the beneficiary of the Cypre funds. Um, Canadian courts, on the other hand, have been rather inconsistent. Um, I think they're getting a little better. I was heartened to see in the last few years some language um, where the judges were clearly attuned to the need to provide a direct or indirect benefit on the class members. But in a lot of cases, that's simply not so. And the, the best example, I think, of this um, is the creation of the Access to Justice Fund at the Law Foundation of Ontario. Uh, a, it's a wonderful uh, fund. It provides many access to justice benefits to the public at large. But it has nothing to do, in most cases, with the matter at issue between the litigants. It provides no more benefit to the class members than it does to their next door neighbor. Um, so courts in Canada, I think, have been pretty inconsistent, uh, certainly in Ontario, about the need for a nexus between the class and the recipient. Um, who cares? In the end, who cares? I mean, if you're not bothered by the lack of compensation, direct or indirect, to the class members, what's the worry? Well, the worry is that um, it leads to possible self-interest on the part of the lawyers involved, both defendants and plaintiffs. It's far easier to simply come to a, a dollar figure, this is, the settlement is X number of dollars, and rather than engage in a very complicated negotiation and expensive claims process, let's just give the money away. I mean, I'm putting it in very, perhaps stark terms, but that's the, that's the fear, right? The incentives that it creates to give away class members' money when it ought not to be. Um, now, reversion is universally rejected also because it, provide, it, I think, creates some perverse incentives. It doesn't certainly encourage defendants to create robust claims processes. But I would argue that Cypre, or a lazy um, application of the Cypre doctrine, creates the same incentives, perverse incentives, on plaintiff's lawyers. Um, pro rata distribution, I've been arguing for years, as have others, Let's look at pro rata distribution as a reasonable alternative, and only recently, like in the last couple of years, have I seen class action judges, especially in British Columbia, say to, to lawyers who come forward with a proposed residual C prey clause, hold on, let's see what happens with the distribution, and depending on the results, come back to me, and maybe we need to take another look at it and make better efforts to locate the class members and, and, and try and compensate them directly. Um, now, deterrence is the other objective that has been voiced by judges and lawyers as justifying Cypre distributions. And here we talk about beneficiaries as the surrogates or the unidentified class members. In one of the earliest Cypre cases in Ontario in 2002, the judge said very specifically, this settlement and these payments largely serve the important policy objective of general and specific deterrence of wrongful conduct. I mean, it doesn't get any more explicit than that, what you're trying to achieve. Um, more recently, in 2013, in the Supreme Court of Canada, we have Sunrise, one of my favorite cases. Um, uh, because there, the, the Cypre doctrine and what objectives are trying to be achieved was front and center to the litigation. It was a price fixing case. Um, there was an argument made by the defendants that because the indirect purchasers could not be identified and compensated in any reasonable way, um, that that should mean, excuse me, the case just doesn't get certified. The, you know, the court, including the majority, says, you know, while it's not ideal, 
to not compensate directly, Cypre is here. It serves a purpose, and that by itself is not reason enough to justify rejecting certification. And I will footnote that what's ironic about that um, particular series of paragraphs was that the only citation was to a, um, a paper published by a law student in the United States that argued against the Cypre um, on the basis that judges um, were at risk of being corrupted in being asked to approve Cypre distributions. So um, oh, some law clerk didn't do their job. Um, the, now, in the Sunrise case, the majority did not uh, ultimately approve um, certification because of the question of identifiable class. That is, that there was not proof of two or more individuals um, who could prove that they had suffered a loss. And so 5-1-B was defeated. The two dissenting judges, however, said, we would certify anyway. Who's to say that the class actions regime requires two people to prove that they suffered an, a quantifiable loss? The Class Proceedings Act doesn't require that class members be capable of proving individual harm. And the loss suffered by the class as a whole is enough to fulfill the deterrence function. So as long as you, you're able to quantify um, the unlawful gains, if you will, of the price-fixing entities, that's all you need. And as long as they disgorge the money to anybody, doesn't have to be the class members, you're fulfilling an important function of the class action, the deterrence function. Um, Justice Karakatsanis writes, while class actions are a procedural vehicle, they're not merely procedural. They make possible claims that are very complex, could not be prosecuted individually, not only because it would be inefficient or unaffordable, but because it may be extremely difficult to prove individual claims. The CPA does have substantive implications. Um, Justice Rothstein, for the majority, disagrees with her on this point and says, and I don't, you know, I think this is really important, this shows a very clear division in thinking amongst members of the court about what it is we're doing here. And he says, in circumstances where, like in this case, it is clear that class members are never going to see a penny, perhaps class proceedings aren't the most appropriate way of addressing behavior modification, i.e., where's the regulator? Why isn't the regulator doing this stuff? Um, so my take on it is that the majority in Sunrise was uncomfortable with private litigation performing a purely regulatory function. Um, more recently, in an Ontario case, and there were companion cases in Quebec and BC, um, there's this type of discussion. The, if access to justice goals are to be achieved, the settlement should be distributed to the class members and not be refunded or distributed Cypre, which achieves behavior modification, but not access to justice for individual class members. So unlike Justices Karakatsanis and Cromwell, we have judges who are saying, Cypre doesn't achieve the, the access to justice function. And that may be a reason not to order it. So we're sort of going in circles. We start with the idea that Cypre is justified on its, because of its compensatory function. We move to a stage where some judges, at least, are very comfortable with class actions using the Cypre device, performing a deterrence function only, even if no compensation gets into the hands of class members. And then we're sort of swinging back with some judges saying Cypre isn't about compensation at all, and we should be very careful about using it. And then, like I said, in a few recent cases, pro rata distribution is now being entertained more seriously. This is my last slide. Um, why is any of this, I think, important, especially for us today? I think because it, it is an apt illustration of the very rich discussion that we saw on the first panel this morning um, about the severability of the different objectives. Um, to what extent are lawyers, private enforcers, acting in a public regulatory manner? Um, if you embrace the deterrence function of class actions, um, as has Craig Jones, um, then it does lead to significant procedural and substantive um, change. It does, for example, as Martin Reddish in the United States has written, 
um, really transform the civil justice, it transforms the remedial choices available to a litigant. So in ordinary binary litigation, um, you have, you know, there's liability and measure of damages, and then the damages are paid to the plaintiff. Here we have an expansion of the remedies available, in effect, to what is the equivalent of a civil fine. You have liability, you have the measure of damages, and then you have the imposition of a fine that's payable by the defendant to some other entity. Um, if you are, if you are, you know, convinced that the deterrence function is important, then Cypre is really not that hard. Um, we don't need to worry about a nexus. What's important is the disgorgement. Um, you could, for example, think about not paying Cypre to charities, but rather giving the money back to the regulator. In price fixing cases, which comprise the largest number of cases where Cypre is ordered, especially of the fixed variety, why not pay that money not to the Boys and Girls Club, but to the Competition Bureau to augment their regulatory function, right? So how you approach Cypre really does depend upon what you view as its objective. If, on the other hand, you favor the compensation function, then you must strictly scrutinize both when it is to be ordered, you have to be vigilant and you have to expect uh, lawyers to present evidence as to what steps they've taken to try and identify class members and get the money into their pockets. You also have to strictly scrutinize the, to whom the money is paid. You want to make sure there is a close nexus so that the benefit is, is um, given to the class members themselves. Um, so that, those are my remarks. I'm very be, uh, happy to answer questions later on. Thank you so much, Professor. I think you raised so important questions as to what can be done when not all class members were identified or did not make any claim uh, to be identified. So I think that a uh, question raises as whether or not the compensation programs that are set in place are adequate and what can be done to reach as many class members as possible to ensure they are uh, adequately compensated. So I, I will now turn to uh, Maitre Bruno, who I think will uh, We'll have some interesting comments to make on uh, member compensation programs. Uh, merci beaucoup, Maître Chenevert. Uh, avant tout, j'aimerais remercier uh, le laboratoire de cyberjustice pour l'invitation de vous adresser la parole. Uh, j'aimerais aussi féliciter le panel uh, qui nous a précédé. C'était fort intéressant. Je vais faire mon possible de uh, être à la moitié intéressante uh, que le panel avant nous. Euh, moi aussi, après le test, si vous avez des questions, je suis bilingue. Je vais vous présenter, euh, ma présentation est en anglais. Cependant, si vous avez des questions à poser, je peux les poser en français. Je réponds en français avec plaisir. So, uh, I am, a, just to introduce myself, I'm a claims administrator. And uh, uh, we work to distribute funds um, to the class pursuant to the terms of settlement as approved by the court. Uh, I've been doing this for 15 years, and um, I have uh, seen all kinds. Uh, I haven't seen them all, by, far from it, but uh, I'm here today to give you uh, one administrator's perspective on what distribution um, is about, the mechanisms of distribution. So um, I have this conversation rather frequently with uh, lawyers who might call on Bruno Group in the early stages of their settlement negotiations when they're trying to, you know, vision uh, what their settlement's going to look like. There are, to my knowledge, there are four types of mechanisms. There is what's called a claims made, which is an insurance term, uh, which involves must file claims. So the claimant must put his or her hand up and make a claim. And claims made cases are ones where the fund is uncapped. So whatever claims come in, the defendant's going to pay for it. And there's no limit, there's no cap, uh, they just sit back and wait for the claims to come in and whatever gets approved, the defendant pays out. <coughs> the next type is the fixed common fund, which is also a must-file process, and this involves a fund that's capped. Um, and this would be a case where class members would receive a pro rata share of the common fund. Just to backtrack, an example of claims made that I've seen uh, would be, uh, I've seen it in a consumer settlement, consumer-based settlement, and I've seen it in a privacy breach settlement. 
Higgs Common Fund is uh, very popular in mass torts, security cases, and other cases. I mean, just about any case can roll into a fixed common fund. The third type is what I call direct payment, and that is where the compensation is distributed automatically to the class members. It normally involves a capped fund, and obviously the damages can be ascertained. Um, I've seen direct payment in all types of cases. There's no particular uh, case type that uh, direct payment um, can be attached to. Of course, the data is the secret on direct payment. Needless to say, you need to have the data of the class in order to directly pay them. Um, and finally, the third mechanism is Cypre, uh, which I'm going to just skip over because it was discussed uh, very well uh, just uh, in the minutes preceding myself. Um, so those are the four types of mechanisms. Now, sometimes you can have a mechanism where you've got a little hybrid of one of the four. Uh, you have one of the four, so you might have a, you might have a claims made fixed fund, uh, you might have a um, direct payment that's got a, a, a claims made uh, arrangement. I mean, these are all, that's between the settling parties. But as a rule, those are the four mechanisms that I see. So I just want to talk about must file claims for a second. I might be stating the obvious, but the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines taking up because that's the lingo in the class action industry is taking up. So taking up in the Merriam-Webster is to respond favorably to, for example, a person offering a bet, a challenge, or a proposal. So in the case at hand, it's a person responding favorably to a class action settlement whereby there is a benefits program to be applied for. With must file claims, the class member must act, and the class member as a rule must support his or her eligibility. So that can range from uh, clicking on a box on a website saying, yes, I purchased uh, the auto lights, or it can be submitting evidence, paper evidence, it can be medical reports, it can be affidavits, but what I'm saying is that the class member as a rule has to substantiate his eligibility upfront, which may be authenticated by my office, but they have to come forward and say, I want a claim, I, know, I think I'm eligible, process my claim, which will then be authenticated. Must file claims, in my observation, is the most commonly used mechanism here in Canada to date. So the next slide I think you're going to like. It's very tiny. I sat down and I went through, so in our office, every time we conclude a case, we prepare a closing report for counsel. In the province of Quebec, um, just recently, our reports are filed with the court. Uh, in the years preceding, uh, in the other jurisdictions, I'm not really sure where our reports go, but they are prepared and they are circulated to counsel. And um, that is done to, uh, that is done because we can do it. We have all the data, why wouldn't we do it? We have an invoice to render. I like for people to pay our invoice and feel good about it. And I also like for people to know possibly what worked or what didn't work. So these are cases that I identified as suitable for what I'm doing here today. These, these are the ones that I, I, I picked out that I thought would be suitable. And my big caveat right now is I am not a trained research analyst. And I don't even know what you call people who do this kind of work, but I think it's a research analyst. So I did my level best to give you an accurate reflection. Uh, but, you know, would it pass scrutiny by a research analyst? Probably not. Because what I tried to do is I tried to fill in the columns for you. So there's 23 cases. And what I did was I inputted them randomly. And then I sorted them in from largest to smallest by take-up rate. Because that's the sexy term that everyone's talking about, is take-up rate. So as you can see, um, my first, uh, so what I'm going to do, I, I see everyone's looking at the, the, the table, I don't blame you. I, I, I've drawn some conclusions of my own, just one woman's opinion. Uh, I've made my own observations about what I see in this table. What I would like to highlight for you are, are what to look at so that you can possibly agree with my observations or maybe disagree or see them differently. Um, if you look at the take-up rate, the best we've seen is a take-up rate of 90%, and the worst we've seen um, 
is near the bottom. Some of them are unknown because the class size is unknown. But if you look at the take up rate in yellow, right next to it is the answer as to whether or not the class was known to the parties, whether it was the defendant or the plaintiff, a class counsel, was the class known? And you'll see there's often a correlation between the take up rate and the yes, no answer. Um, what's interesting is you may not see a correlation if you look at the column near the end, the second last one, the average payment. I tried to give you an idea does the amount of money that's being dispersed, is that connected to take up? And it's, it's not clear to me that there is a connection. So if you're getting 20 bucks, or you're getting 5,000 bucks, or $20,000, it's not clear to me if there is a connection to take up. But I give you those dollar figures so that you're able to see it um, and draw your own conclusions as to whether, I mean, certainly the larger sums, but if you look way down at the bottom, case 21, the average payment was $26,500. The thing is, I'm not sure if the class size was known. So, but I can tell you intuitively, I have some ideas about whether the take up was high or low. And I would say on that case, the take up was um, moderately low. But that's just an intuitive thing. I, I can't put that in a table. It's not fair to, uh, to all of you who might look at this and, and rely on it. Um, the other thing I did in the first column was I identified for you uh, as best I could what kind of case it was. Consumer and PI is personal injury. Uh, our office does a lot of personal injury settlements. Um, and then I referred you back to, if you remember, I told you there were four types of mechanisms. Uh, pardon me. So uh, I showed you if it was claims made versus fixed common fund. Uh, versus direct pay. Now, the column in between the Cypre, um, where you see the letter R next to the dollar figure, so 282,000 R, that's residual. That is a, un, unclaimed, undistributed funds. Everything I report in terms of Cypre is residual because if it was the other type of Cypre arrangement that Jasminka described where the administrators aren't retained. So I would, I would know nothing about that. These are cases where we were retained, we distributed funds, and this was what the residual amount was. There's one dollar figure that sticks out there big time. You see $708,000 in residual, and you might be wondering, good God, why wasn't that paid out? That's because the class size was huge, and to even prorate the $708,000 between class members made no sense. So it was instead d donated Cypre. All of these Cypre payments are issued pursuant to a court order. So the parties go back to court, they submit to uh, the court what the, um, who the beneficiaries of the Cypre payments are, and it is then agreed to and accepted and approved by the court by way of court order. You'll see that we have one case where there's a reversion, case 17. So we don't see that too often. So that's where the funds are reverted back to the defendant in the event that they're unspent, that there's funds left unspent. I gotta watch my time. Um, so I wanted to put this table up to show you some data because I often hear there's no data, there, there's, no, there's nothing to look to, and there is data. It's in my office and it's in other administrators' offices. And it's possible to, it's not a secret, I'm not keeping it secret from you on purpose, um, nobody asks. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know we talked about it, and, um, you know, I, I'm not revealing what the cases are, because not all of these closing reports are public. Like I said, they're prepared, they're submitted to council, and I don't know where they go, with the exception of the province of Quebec, where by now a closing report is prepared and filed with the court, which I think is awesome. It's very helpful to everybody involved, considering the time and expense and years that go by, and considering what the uh, legislative mandate is. Um, I think it's a great idea. Do these closing reports solve everything or answer everything, or you know, should they be relied on for all future decisions? I don't think so. They're just facts. It's just data. Um, 
So I'm going to let you know what my observations are. And um, my, if you look at the, the red axis, the one, two, three, four, five, fifth column, direct pay, do you see that all of the direct pay cases float to the top? It's a no-brainer, but direct payment is how you achieve high take-up rates, in my opinion, and in my experience, in my office. So direct payment, just to explain practically how that works, is the matter is settled, there is a data dump of the class that is provided to the administrator. Often what we do is we print the notice of settlement approval, because that's required, and we enclose a check, and we mail it. And then it is up to the class member to receive that check, take it to the bank, and cash it. It's that simple. And just a little, little comment here, when you mail the check, you don't mail a check in a white envelope that looks like a piece of junk mail. You gotta spend some money printing the envelope and putting on the envelope what it is, what it's about. You don't say there's a check enclosed because the envelope will get stolen. But you make it clear that this is a piece, you gotta, you gotta make it a piece of mail that someone's gonna open. And then once they open it and they get that check, it's entirely up to them to run it to the bank or not. And the check expires in six months as per the banking out of the Bank Canadian Payments Association. It expires in six months and if you haven't cashed it, too bad, so sad. So that is one method. And the only way that comes back and becomes complicated is you mail the check, the person's deceased, so the family comes back and says, look, you know, he's died, can we get the check reissued in the name of the estate? Um, oh, uh, can, um, you know, uh, we're divorced, can I get half the check in my name? I mean, there's all kinds of funky things like this that can come up. <laughs> but this, this is, by our statistical measures, like I said, is the best. I did the best, my level best for you today. There is the mechanism to get that money into the hands of the class. And what I want to say about the data dump now is that this is changing. This is a moving target. I've been doing this 15 years, and I'm seeing a dramatic change in terms of the data dump that can be accessed and made available. Technology is eroding our privacy. And for example, on consumer class actions, many, many retailers have the data because they are tracking, tracking their customers. Customer transactions are being tracked. So um, you can have, a, I mean, an obvious example would be Costco. Every time you go to Costco and you buy, uh, you buy a flower, you buy a box of chocolates, it's all tracked. So if there is a settlement to be had involving Costco, they can tell you exactly who bought those products, who the class is. Now that's, that's an example because they have memberships. But technology is eroding our privacy and we are being tracked and there's all kinds of data out there that I'm just saying, think about it, it's available. It is a means, potentially, to achieving direct payment. Merci, Ms. Bruno. I think, I, I think one can raise a question, how does Canada and, uh, and Quebec, for, for, for everyone who's here, compare to other jurisdictions? Was there anywhere that found a better mechanism or any perfect mechanism to compensate all class members? So I think I'll turn to Professor Berry to perhaps add some insight for us as to how uh, European, European jurisdictions have uh, treated compensation and whether or not we should learn from uh, from what has been done in uh, in this jurisdiction. Okay, I will come back to that in a second. Let me just talk. Okay. Um, Mesdames et Messieurs, d'abord, je veux remercier les organisateurs de cette conférence et surtout ma chère copine du collègue Catherine pour l'invitation. Uh, pour moi, c'était un long voyage, mais je suis absolument ravi d'être ici. Ladies and gentlemen, I will hold my presentation in, in English and I will start with a little anecdote. Uh, almost 10 years ago, I started to dig into the topic of complex litigation and collective redress. And I wanted to write a PhD about that. And my supervisor, who had written a PhD about res judicata and had touched on the issue of the binding effect of a judicial decision on third parties, 
recommended me to talk with an American scholar, since the class action mechanism was seen as the hallmark feature of the American legal system. And over the course of the years, this now colleague, and I will not disclose his or her identity, provided me with a wealth of information. However, the very first book he or she gave me was a children's book. It was Morris Sendak's epic book, Where the Wild Things Are. And since then, I still have the book. I want you to bring it with me, but I have two little children, and my oldest son doesn't allow me to take it from him. <laughs> since then, I have looked with boundless curiosity and inquisitiveness at these wild things. And over the years, and as in the book, they have looked tantalizing and exciting, but other times I have perceived them as unfriendly and menacing. But what is for sure is the fact that these wild things have spread across the world, including Europe. Now, regarding uh, collective redress and class actions in Europe, first of all, there is a terminology issue. When you look at all these European documents, you will never find the term class actions. And once I was at a meeting with people from the European Commission, and I asked them, why do you always talk about collective redress? and not class actions. And they said, well, it's a marketing thing. We cannot talk about class actions. It should be collective redress because class <coughs> actions, people immediately think about US class actions. Now, the focus in Europe have, regarding collective redress, class actions, action, group, action collective, has always been on competition law and on consumer. And over the course of the years, there have been many, many studies and reports The European Commission is very good at paying academics to issue reports and they don't do anything with that. So there were a lot of reports, but on the other hand, there were also some legal instruments. Uh, for example, the CPC regulation, the Consumer Protection Cooperation Regulation, was important. There was uh, the uh, Directive on Consumer Rights, and very importantly, and it was touched upon in the first panel, there was an injunctive directive allowing associations to bring injunctive class actions. If a company does something wrong, then an association can bring an action. There was an evaluation before that, that was pretty successful. Now in 2013, a little bit out of the blue, I didn't expect it that early, the European Commission issued a recommendation on uh, common principles for injunctive and compensatory collective redress mechanisms. Now, the recommendation ladies and gentlemen, contrary to a directive and a regulation, is a non-binding instrument. That recommendation simply lists a whole list of non-binding principles that relate to the judicial and extra-judicial resolution of mass cases. Now, um, the uh, recommendation is now being evaluated in 2017. I think the day before I left for Canada, the Commission also published a call for evidence, which is also open for networking, so if you are interested in providing evidence to the European Commission on how class actions work, you can do that. Now, we will have to wait and see what will happen with that. But sometimes recommendations turn into binding directives, and there is some rumor that because of the Volkswagen case, there might be some political will to do that, although I'm not absolutely sure about that. There's a lot of lobby going on in the European Parliament, so we will have to wait and see what will happen. Now, this is the list of those binding principles, and this list overlaps a little bit with the general features of how European class actions look like. There are, of course, various models. There are 28 member states, well, minus one, but 27 member states. So there are various models, so it's difficult to give a broad overview. First of all, these European class actions are normally of what's called a transubstantive or universal nature in theory. In some countries, class actions are limited to a specific sector. For example, in Belgium and in France, they are limited to consumer cases. In France, it has expanded to also to competition cases, environmental cases, discrimination cases. Secondly, they allow injunctive and compensatory redress. Standing, and this is a very controversial issue, uh, which probably will be touched upon in, in further panels, standing is given to associations or organizational plaintiffs or public bodies. Standing is not given to 
individuals. I can talk about that very extensively, but I would not do that. I think it's a very controversial issue, and it basically has to do with the funding issue. At the bottom, you can see no contingency fees, no punitive damages, um, softly regulated third party litigation fund. And the basic idea is if you allow a, a, an individual to bring class actions, then it has to be funded. Now, a solution could be allow lawyers to fund class action litigation and a safeguard could be an automatic safeguard could be well. You can have the judge assessing the lawyer's fees and the costs, which makes sense. Together with a, a Dutch colleague from the University of Tilburg, I did some research about the question, would European judges be willing to do that? Our conclusion was no. Even in cases where the lawyers, fees in one-on-one -on -one cases, are being disputed by the clients, most European judges say, I am not going to say whether this is reasonable or fair. They ask an advice at the local bar, and then usually they fund that. So I think that could be a problem. The default is, according to the recommendation, and in most European countries, is an opt-in principle, although the time is changing. First of all, more and more countries are allowing opt-out class actions, and now there are a number of countries that allow the judge simply to choose, the judge has the discretionary power to choose between an opt-in and an opt-out class action. Now, um, what is important is when you look at these policy documents, and it was already mentioned before in the first panel by Professor Izakura, is that there is this absolute fear of US class actions. The examples of such adverse effects can be seen in particular in class actions as no in the US. So these documents, these policies, always boil, boil down to provide a lot of safeguards to avoid abusive litigation, which can create a problem of a catch-22 problem. First of all, I don't know if there is, and I know in the US, I'm not a US scholar, but I know this is controversial, whether class actions in the US are really abusive. I think this is a controversial issue. Two, there are jurisdictions, common law jurisdictions, where there are no abuses. For example, here in Canada, I don't really have the impression, the impression that class actions are abusive. And also, there are European jurisdictions that have class actions, where you can also ask yourself the questions, well, is this abuse? So I think this is a bit of a, a, a hard and, and there's sometimes a little bit of, a, bit of a, cheap, a cheap argument. Now, these three class action goals have been mentioned before compensation, deterrence, and judicial efficiency. But, and again, Zakharov has hit the nail on the head in the first panel, this is the most controversial issue in Europe. And contrary to the US and other common law jurisdictions, where class actions are not only seen as a compensation mechanism, but also as a regulatory enforcement mechanism, this is not the case in Europe. For historical reasons, Bismarck, um, Napoleon, the division between public and private enforcement is clearer and stronger, and this remains so in the class action. This is just a fact. I mean, you can disagree with that, but this is a simple fact. All these documents, the recommendations, for example, emphasize that class actions can only supplement public enforcement. And a concretization of this are so-called collective follow-on actions in fields of law where a public authority is, is empowered to adopt a decision that there has been a law violation. Collective regress actions can only start after this public process. And the rationale, the idea behind this is that the public interest, and again, the need to avoid abusive litigation, can be presumed to have been taken into account by the public authority. And an example of this you can find in France. France allows for competition class actions, but these competition class actions can only focus on compensation, and they can only be brought after the National Competition Authority, which can be the French regulator or the European Commission, has finished its public process. So it can only focus on compensation. Now, so there's no deterrence, the focus is only on compensation and on judicial efficiency. 
However, what is very strange, what is very strange, and not a lot of people have written about that, is what you see now, and again, this is extremely controversial, you see that a lot of, and this, this is not a policy, this is just something that, I mean, that is going on on the market. A lot of European regulators are starting to focus on compensation and restitution. In a lot of cases, because there is no alternative for the duke shareholders or the duke consumers. And on the slide, you can see some examples. For example, the financial regulator in Italy, Banca d'Italia, has the, uh, the possibility to issue what are called specifici formi di offerta, orders to redress. They can order banks to pay back clients. Another example is in the UK, where this has been institutionalized. In 2008, there was the Regulatory Enforcement and Sanctions Act, which allows regulators to ask the government for a sort of accreditation, and based on that, they can force companies that did something wrong to pay people back. Now, two general observations about this, what is called new technology, is that they are market-driven again, sometimes as a counter-reaction or a backlash because the judicial system fails and cannot offer a, a solution. And secondly, they're very controversial. They're believers, non-believers, especially this idea, what's called regulatory redress, is, is very contentious because you can say that regulators can be politically captured, they can be selective, they lack sufficient means. So I think in some cases it works, but I think it's very difficult, difficult to extrapolate this as a general model. Although in the last revision of the CPC regulation, there was a provision allowing that, but the amendment, the amendment was withdrawn by the European Parliament. Now the biggest problem, and this panel is about compensation of citizens through the class action, and Lola has shown some very nice numbers, but unfortunately I am not able to show them, although I will show some of them. And there's no empirical data for the very simple reason that there is no data. There's no number of the number of class actions that are being brought, the outcome, the question of compensation. Although, and you can see it on the slide, the European Commission wants member states to have a registry of collective regress actions. Now, as an academic, of course, this is interesting because I said, well, I do want to have that data. So over the years, I have tried to collect that data. Now, this has cost me a lot of time and effort. And on the slide in the right column, you can see the number of cases in the different countries that have class actions, class action alike mechanisms that are being brought. Now, I will not say a lot about that. The only conclusion is the number of cases is very low. And of course, <laughs> opponents will say, you see, class actions don't work. Proponents will say, there are not a lot of class actions, so we should do more to bring them. The only exception is Poland, which is very strange. They are a very litigious country. Apparently, 210 class actions were brought, but most of them were not very successful. Now, regarding compensation and European class actions, I would like to make four general observations. The first general observation has to do with the fact that the policy of a lot of those European countries is on the out-of-court compensation of mass harm situations. And the biggest example, and I assume that most of you are familiar with that, is the notorious Dutch Collective Settlement Act, which is the new export product of the Netherlands. There was a paper a couple of years ago by Willem van Boon who said, beyond the tulips and cheese. But the Dutch Collective Settlement Act are the new tulips and cheese to export. They are settlement only class actions, in the sense that you have an association that finds out that a company did something wrong, they contact the instructed company, and they try and get a, a collective settlement. If there is a collective settlement, they go to the Amsterdam Court of Appeal that will approve or disapprove of the settlement. So at the outset, you need a settlement. If there is no settlement, there's no Dutch Collective Settlement Act. Over the course of the years, the Dutch legislature has created some tools 
to facilitate a settlement. And one of these tools is the technique of what's called the prejudicial questions, which is to a prejudicial, where you can go to the court and say we have a problem of law, please resolve that issue, and in light of the outcome of that issue, we will continue the negotiations. There's also another technique which is called pre-procedural hearing, where you can ask for a judge, another judge than the Amsterdam judge, to help and mediate. Now, it's very interesting that set that new act has a large cross-border implications because in one of those cases, I'm going to show that on the next slide or this slide, you can see uh, the number of uh, seven of these Dutch collective settlements and the year, the nature, the class, funding, the settlement, and the fee for the association. Unfortunately, there's no data about uh, on how many class members were compensated, the take of rate, etc. Now, the first case, the DES case, was a personal liability case that had to do with the hormone death, which also led to litigation, I think, in the US. The other cases are securities cases and were triggered mainly by the Morrison decision in the US. The Morrison decision, the US Supreme Court said no foreign class members. Now then the lawyers of those cases, mainly smart American lawyers, said, well, we have to find a solution. And then they looked on the map of the world and they said, well, there's the Netherlands with the Dutch collective settlement. That. Let's try that, which they did. And a very important case is the convenience because in the Convenient case, which was a class action settlement in the US, but a large part of the class members were Swiss, so they were not allowed to be part of the class action in the US. They set up an association in the Netherlands, representing the Swiss shareholders, and everybody thought, well, the Amsterdam court will have problems regarding jurisdiction. The Amsterdam court said no. And also in the Shell case, that was the same. And when you read those decisions, the court said, no, we have to do something. We have to offer compensation for these class members because there is no alternative. There is no class action in Switzerland. So all these people should bring their individual cases. That doesn't make sense. So that was one of the reasons why the Amsterdam Court of Appeal claimed international jurisdiction. And that was, there was a talk of, of the president of that court a couple of years ago, who literally said, I was quite surprised by that and taken away by that. He said that was a political decision. We want Amsterdam to become an international hub for class action settlements. Now, the problem is, is that that system has been copied by other countries in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Austria. And if those sports would adopt the same case law, of claiming international jurisdiction, then you will see problems of foreign shopping and the question which court has jurisdiction. Now what is important, and I'm sometimes a little bit of a naughty boy, is that in two of these cases, American lawyers who are involved in the Shell case and in the Convenient case, a large portion of the settlement went to the US lawyers, but again, the Amsterdam court said that's okay, because the alternative is, is that there is not and they said that the fees for the lawyers that were involved were reasonable and fair. And I personally think in those two cases they were reasonable and fair. Especially the Convenient, especially the, um, the convenient case, which was quite a, a, a big case. My second observation is that, and this is a little bit of Belgian experience, is that you see that in systems where they have class actions, that the class action can be a trigger for compensation. Now, this might be anecdotal evidence, but in Belgium, we have a, a class action mechanism for consumers, and the judge can choose between an opt-in and an opt-out system. The first case that was brought by the Consumer Association was a case brought against an airline, Thomas Cook Airline. It was a plane that had to fly, I think, from Gran Canaria to Brussels, and everybody was on the plane, but suddenly somebody got sick on the plane, had to be removed off the plane, and there was somebody with an ambulance to lift. He probably drank to many sangrias or something, and he collided with the plane, the plane was damaged. There was a delay of 16 hours, Thomas Cook Airlines offered a compensation, the passengers were not happy with that, they wanted more money. The moment the class action was announced in the media and was brought, Thomas Cook immediately 
update everybody. So in that sense, they were sort of triggered. The, the, the only discussion that is not, that is now still ongoing before the Brussels court in that case has to do with the fees of the association. Third general observation, and I would not say too much about that because it's a very difficult issue, is the folks of the case in the sense that I do think that there is a very urgent need for a class action or an MDL device as a tool for cross-border compensation. Because what you see now in Europe in Volkswagen case is really a, a nightmare. There are some cases being brought by shareholders that are being consolidated in Germany, but if you see what is happening for consumers, then it's a mess. And I think it's a really missed opportunity in 2012-2013 at the European Parliament and the Council that they did not amend the process one this language to allow for a system to have a sort of one European court that can deal with these kind of cases. I think that's really a missed opportunity. And my third, fourth general observation, and that is not on the slide, is when it comes to calculating damages and distributing damages, most of the European policymakers do not pay attention to that. They simply think that the general rules apply, which is not the case. I mean, it's, it's also a missed opportunity that there is no attention to have specific rules of distribution of damages. There are some exceptions, for example, the Belgian class action has a provision that resembles the Cypretechnique, but that's very, very limited. Now, to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I think that European class actions, I always say that European class actions are like a box of chocolates. I am from Belgium and we have something with chocolates. And to close for us, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> de plusieurs éminents juristes et je laisse de l'idée à quel point ça n'est pas euh, intimidant. Donc, euh, vous avez euh, probablement déjà entendu la célèbre phrase « Justice delayed is justice denied ». Et euh, par quelques recherches, j'ai tenté de découvrir qui avait été euh, le premier à l'utiliser sans succès. Euh, malheureusement, je n'ai pas pu déterminer c'était qui euh, le prononçait avec certitude. Et... Euh, je vous dirais que c'est là un bel exemple de l'effet du passage du temps sur les faits qui se présentent devant nous. Le temps qui s'écoule est une, une loi qui est immuable et à l'échelle de notre système de justice, c'est une problématique qui est récurrente et préoccupante. Il y a différentes manifestations du temps en droit. On peut penser à la prescription acquisitive, extinctive, à tous les délais qui se trouvent à travers nos lois et règlements. Euh, également, le temps en droit se segmente et euh, il devient un outil de mesure et parfois même de démesure pour le calcul des coûts, euh, notamment les heures facturables qu'on peut charger comme avocat. La professeure Piché vous a entretenu ce matin euh, par rapport aux travaux de recherche qui, sont, euh, qui ont été effectués depuis les deux dernières années au laboratoire euh, sur les actions collectives ici à l'Université de Montréal et euh, j'ai pris part à une partie de ces travaux-là. Donc aujourd'hui, j'ai tenté de mettre en commun certaines données qu'on a avancées et euh, l'objectif de ma présentation, euh, c'est d'explorer les incidents du passage du temps sur l'action collective et plus particulièrement sur la compensation des membres. Donc de manière générale, on a observé que euh, dans la plupart des cas, les actions euh, collectives, là, dans, dans les dossiers qu'on a, euh, qu a vus et où on a trouvé euh, suffisamment de données, d'ailleurs j'aimerais bien avoir accès au bureau de <rire> Maître Bruno, ça aurait facilité euh, notre vie euh, beaucoup et l'été dernier. Euh, donc on a observé que euh, les procédures d'action collective durent généralement entre 2 et 6 ans, soit entre le dépôt initial de la demande d'autorisation jusqu'à la fin de l'action, que ce soit par transaction ou par euh, jugement. Et sur cette période, entre une et trois années sont consacrées à euh, la demande d'autorisation. Donc c'est souvent entre la, le tiers et la moitié du temps de l'action qui est consacré à ce processus-là. On a principalement voulu calculer les take-upers ou les taux de compensation, mais on voulait aussi les mettre en contexte à travers des données euh, factuelles extérieures à ce qui était nécessaire pour calculer les taux euh, dans chaque action. Et pour les profanes, euh, le taux de compensation, ça représente le pourcentage des membres qui ont reçu une compensation. 
par rapport à la totalité des membres qui avaient droit à la compensation. Donc, par exemple, si on a un take-up rate de 100%, bien, ça veut dire que tous les membres qui avaient droit à la compensation ont reçu quelque chose. Je vais tout de suite vous décevoir et gâcher un peu le, le suspense qui dure depuis euh, le début. On n'a pas réussi euh, à noter une corrélation entre la durée des actions et le euh, taux de compensation. Par contre, on a quand même fait plusieurs observations qui nous permettent de voir qu'il y a euh, des, plusieurs effets du temps qui, euh, qui passent sur euh, la compensation des membres. La majorité des règles de preuve qui s'appellent dans les tribunaux visent à euh, assurer la fiabilité des éléments qui sont présentés au juge et sur lesquels ils se basent pour euh, rendre ses décisions. Et c'est d'ailleurs fort dommage que le législateur n'ait aucune emprise sur le temps parce que l'écoulement du temps gruge la preuve disponible et, tant, et ça serait tant au détriment du demandeur que du défendeur. Donc la disparition des meilleurs témoins, que ce soit en raison euh, de, on a parlé tout à l'heure, décès, déménagement, mise à pied de l'employé, altération de la mémoire des témoins qui sont euh, présents aussi avec le temps qui passe, euh, la perte des documents, d'éléments matériels, ce sont tous des exemples où le temps qui passe détériore la qualité des informations qui sont euh, à la cour et qui complique ce processus de recherche de la vérité. Il faut quand même souligner que les carences dans la preuve, pas, ça n'a pas seulement un effet sur la qualité des décisions, ça a également euh, un effet sur le règlement des litiges. Donc, la non-disponibilité d'éléments de preuve et ceux qui sont en pratique privée euh, pourront confirmer que ça fait partie des conseils qui sont donnés euh, aux clients que euh, d'évaluer la force probante de ce qu'on a sous la main. Donc, L'absence d'éléments de preuve importants peut euh, donner à une partie face à une autre un levier de négociation suffisamment important pour les amener euh, peut-être à accepter un règlement qui est plus bas que euh, ce qui aurait moins avantageux plutôt que ce à quoi euh, la partie adresse aurait pu avoir le droit autrement. Et c'est là que ça devient pertinent parce que dans les dossiers qu'on a observés, 95 euh, se sont conclus par un règlement à l'amiable. On peut se demander si certaines lacunes dans la preuve ont pu avoir un effet euh, autant sur euh, le, ce nombre-là que sur euh, les montants euh, qui ont été euh, acceptés à titre, euh, à titre de règlement. À une plus petite échelle, on s'est demandé si la problématique de la, de la dispersion de la preuve euh, s'étendait jusqu'au monde. Et je suis contente de voir que les données que le euh, maître Bruno a présentées rejoignent un peu ce qu'on a trouvé parce que dans euh, près de 50 des dossiers, on avait ce fameux processus qui impliquait une action euh, au fait que le, le réclamant va lever la main euh, pour, pour les membres. Et euh, plus particulièrement, les membres doivent effectuer cette action-là positive, remplir un, une déclaration qui est souvent un formulaire et qu'on doit accompagner généralement de documents justificatifs pour avoir droit à la compensation, comme par exemple les preuves d'achat d'un produit. D'ailleurs, c'est une réflexion qu'on avait euh, des étudiants du laboratoire, probablement qu'il y a bien peu d'entre vous dans la salle et d'entre nous qui vont conserver en vue d'une potentielle action collective de leur reçu euh, d'achat du quotidien, comme une clé USB ou un paquet de jambon affecté par la Je ne sais pas si certains d'entre vous ont eu cette problématique-là. Mais tout de même, on a été agréablement surpris parce qu'on a constaté euh, dans les dossiers qu'on a observé que le passage du temps et la destruction de tous ces documents-là euh, ne semble pas avoir eu d'effet sur la possibilité pour les membres de recevoir compensation. Les taux de participation qu'on a calculés étaient excellents. Euh, en général, 95 ou plus euh, des déclarations des membres ont été acceptées. Et on a répertorié dans tous nos dossiers seulement un où des membres se sont vus refuser compensation parce qu'il leur manquait des documents justificatifs. Donc, c'est assez encourageant. Le problème de la compensation des membres, c'est peut-être pas nécessairement cette perte-là de documents qui sont liés avec le temps. Le vrai problème se situe en amont et c'est comment retrouver les membres et comment les convaincre de réclamer leur Donc, en bref, comment est-ce qu'on peut établir la connexion entre le membre et le processus de compensation? Cette importance-là de rejoindre les membres ne doit pas être sous-estimée et le temps a un effet à cet égard-là aussi. On a constaté à travers nos recherches, et c'était... Excusez-moi. C'est pas moi. On va continuer sans, euh, sans le PowerPoint. Donc, on a... Euh, 
On a constaté dans nos recherches, et c'était un, un des, une des données qui était les plus, euh, les plus euh, disons, fortes, euh, que euh, l'identification et la prise de contact avec les membres, c'est le facteur le plus déterminant d'une compensation qui est réussie. Et d'ailleurs, euh, dans la majorité des dossiers où on a un take-up rate de plus de 70 on a vu que les membres étaient déjà identifiés ou facilement retraçables. Donc, par exemple, si on peut se fier sur une liste de clients, euh, la liste des gens qui étaient, par exemple, euh, passagers d'un avion. Eh bien, ça va être plus facile, bien évidemment, d'entrer en contact avec eux que si on pense à une masse de consommateurs qui, par exemple, ont acheté ce fameux paquet de jambon qui est passé entre les mains de plusieurs distributeurs et détaillants. Le passage du temps va complexifier euh, considérablement l'exercice de la recherche euh, des membres. Et plus le temps passe, plus les coûts pour trouver les membres sont élevés et plus les chances de les retrouver baissent. Et selon nos observations, euh, tous les dossiers où on a vu qu'il y avait des efforts importants, additionnels, euh, qui ont été faits pour retrouver les membres, ont toujours eu des taux de compensation plus intéressants que euh, les autres dossiers. Et euh, par ailleurs, on a aussi remarqué que l'implication active des juges dans le processus de recherche euh, des membres a toujours influencé très positivement les taux de compensation. Donc, par exemple, quand les juges ont posé des questions, ont demandé une reddition de compte, ce qui maintenant euh, fait partie des règles de pratique euh, de notre, nos cours au Québec, ou euh, quand euh, les juges ont imposé des mesures additionnelles, notamment parfois des réouvertures de périodes de recherche. Demande. Mais tout n'est pas si simple et euh, la recherche des membres, ce n'est pas, une, pas un remède miracle à tous les problèmes parce que c'est également un investissement de temps qui a un coût important. Et quand les membres euh, se partagent une cagnotte, euh, et bien plus on met d'argent dans la recherche des membres, bien on vient, euh, on vient euh, d'autant diminuer l'argent qui leur sera remis. Donc, c'est une question de proportionnalité. Probablement pas toujours simple à évaluer quand on est dans le vif de l'action. Dernière et autre question intéressante. Est-ce qu'une même compensation est moins juste si elle est payée après un délai qui est plus long? Et euh, je reviendrai avec. Oh, on revient. <rire> Est-ce que justice différée équivaut à un délai de justice? Donc, le professeur Jean-François Robert de l'Université de Sherbrooke, nous, excusez-moi, je. Euh, le professeur Robert de l'Université de Sherbrooke nous a donné une piste euh, de, de réponse à travers une étude qu'il a divulguée en 2014 où il a mesuré le sentiment d'accès à la justice des usagers de, des conférences de règlement à l'amiable. Et euh, il s'avère que tant pour les personnes physiques que les personnes morales, et tant en matière civile que commerciale, euh, la rapidité, ce que lui a appelé le facteur temps, et la principale motivation des justiciables à régler un litige plutôt qu'à aller en procès. Et euh, c'est encore plus surprenant parce que ce facteur-là est, est arrivé premier devant d'autres facteurs comme le coût du procès et les risques du procès. Donc les justiciables, qu'ils soient des entreprises ou des particuliers, se soucient de la rapidité du règlement de leur litige. Il y a plusieurs auteurs qui abondent dans le même sens et euh, qui affirme que l'attente de la justice pour le justiciable est souvent anxiogène. Et euh, ça se demande également avec la vie du législateur, puisque dans cette nouvelle ère dans laquelle on se trouve, on peut commencer avec la nouvelle culture judiciaire du rapport Ferland et qui euh, s'est contredit avec euh, l'adoption en vigueur de notre euh, nouveau code de procédure civile. Euh, le législateur a bien rationalisé l'usage du temps euh, par les justiciables pour leur demander d'en faire un usage plus, euh, plus raisonnable et avec comme objectif avoué d'assurer la sécurité de la justice. Et on a introduit plusieurs euh, principes directeurs. On parle de la proportionnalité à l'article 18, la saine administration euh, des instances, euh, la saine plutôt gestion des instances à l'article 9. Donc ce sont tous des principes directeurs qui sont directement reliés à un usage plus judicieux du temps. Et c'est d'autant plus d'actualité parce que que ça soit dans le système de santé ou en justice, la mesure du temps semble être devenue l'étalon de la qualité de nos services publics. Et depuis l'arrêt Jordan, les yeux des Canadiens sont vraiment tournés vers, euh, vers le système de justice, que ça soit civil ou criminel. Et euh, si nos tribunaux sont parfois vivre une crise de confiance qui est due... Euh, en tout cas, je crois que cette crise est euh, liée à ce, à ce passage du temps 
qui est sur la rue de son Pour conclure, on n'a pas pu, euh, comme je vous mentionnais au départ, établir une corrélation directe entre le temps et le nombre de membres euh, qui euh, sont compensés, mais on peut quand même entrevoir que le temps a un effet euh, autant sur le montant que sur euh, le nombre de membres euh, qui sont euh, compensés. Et euh, comme, euh, comme on l'a mentionné, le passage du temps dans ces membres-là est beaucoup plus difficile à identifier, à retracer, alors que c'est cette connexion à établir avec les membres, selon nos recherches et nos observations dans les boursiers de cours, c'est le facteur qui favorise le plus une compensation réussie. Donc, comment est-ce qu'on connecte? Euh, on a observé aussi euh, que la majorité des avis envoyés aux membres le sont encore via des journaux. Et peu, euh, peu de moyens technologiques, comme par exemple les réseaux sociaux, sont encore utilisés. Et pour cette raison-là, le, le laboratoire euh, va euh, très proche, prochainement pardon, se concentrer euh, sur euh, notamment la rédaction et la recherche euh, au niveau euh, des avis aux membres, notamment les technologiques. 